Thank you for tuning in to Rowdy Cards TV on RowdyCards.com. Uh, my name is Patrick Greeno, and today I have Dwyer Brown online. So this is a very special uh, interview. Dwyer Brown plays John Kinsella in the movie Field of Dreams. If you haven't seen it, go right out and, and take a look. There's a link below to watch the movie or to get the movie. Um, Dwyer's, uh, you know, I met him in early August at the National Sports Collectors Convention, and um, it was a real pleasure meeting him because uh, this is a movie I grew up with. It was always a part of my childhood. I saw it first when I was seven years old, and it's just kind of carried with me through the years as I've become an adult. And I, I still watch it. I'm always teary-eyed at the end when he comes into the scene. I was seven years old when we made it. Yeah. Just here. <laughs> uh, you were 29, right? When 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 you when that happened, sure. and I I remember seeing the movie and, and thinking at the end, um, when when you do play catch with with Ray Kinsella. I didn't know until I read your book that it's implied that you know that you're a father and son relationship. Right. I didn't get that until in the book you had made that clear. And it, all these years, it kind of like I was like, do they? Does he know that he's the dad of this guy? I always was like curious about that. But yeah. well, they changed. It. I mean, as I mentioned in the book, they changed. They added the word dad, and he says it used to just be, "Hey, you want to have a catch?" Right. But they added the word dad because a lot of the people at screenings were confused. They thought they thought that Ray Kinsella would have been very cruel not to say, you're my dad, you know, I love you or whatever, you know. And so, uh, you know, the compromise was made to just have him say dad so that everybody knows, okay, he's expressed that. And, and you know, because I, I suppose it would have been sad if, if I'd walked back into the corner and not known, but... The whole time we were shooting it, I was sort of playing that it was uh, inner knowledge, but like everybody sort of understands that if you step outside the baselines of the field, something weird is going to happen, like when Doc Graham has to go rescue uh, uh, Karen, that, uh, you know, something's going to happen. And I sort of made that my inner knowledge that somehow we know that this field is our little heaven and it, we can't, you know, go beyond that. So anyway. Yeah, that's... You weren't alone. <laughs> I've always liked that scene, though, because it's, the like I said, James Horner really produced, I think, a score that matched the layout of the movie and, and the flow, almost scene to scene. And it was really, looking, every time I watch it, I, I see it as it plays out at that last scene. It's very, he's really touched on that emotion of that, that scene. You know, how when you ask him is this heaven? He says, no, it's Iowa. And he looks back and he sees his family on the porch and he looks back at you and says, you know, maybe this is heaven. The, the music with that scene, all that part kind of like is really packaged very well. I've always thought that it was very well done. Well, I, I tribute uh, Jamie Horner's uh, score with making that movie what it is. I mean, we all shot it and we thought it was great and the scene played really well, but it was only when we saw the cast and crew screening that I realized how much that rumbling score of his, it starts out so mysterious, and, and then towards the end, it, it's like a thunderstorm coming, coming across the plains or something. It was only then that I realized what a pivotal part I had. I thought I was just this little you know, five-page scene that kind of wrapped up the final loose end of the movie, and it was only at the screening I thought, oh my gosh, this whole movie is moving towards me from the beginning. Nobody knows that, of course, which is why when I appear, I mean, there was a, a, an audible sigh in many theaters when I went to go see the movie, you know, with strangers just to have the experience. Uh, it, it, you could hear people like, oh, the father, the father. Oh, you hear them whispering, and it was, it was remarkable, really, because I did not anticipate that at all. Didn't see that one coming. Yeah, you know, um, in your book you talked about, I think it was, was it the producer and the director that asked you to go see the movie in Westwood? And you were like, hadn't you guys had, a, had enough of this film? And they were like, no, 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 it's not the film. Like, what, listen to the audience's reactions. Yeah, they, they had lived with the film. I mean, just in the shooting to the edit, you know, through the editing, that's two years yeah. of looking at my stupid face and everybody else's time after time after time. And I thought, what, what are they talking about? I've never done that with a movie before. There's movies I've been in I still haven't seen. Uh, you know, even in home video or anything, but I was so glad that I did that because it really was remarkable in that way. For the audiences who didn't already know that the dad was appearing, it was so shocking to them. It, 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 like something 
I, I've never experienced before. What a surprise that was to people, and what a, you know, what a gosh, it just would. There'd be a torrent of, of emotion. I mean, the, the the strangest thing was watching the movie credits complete. Guys, particularly guys, and to me, mostly big guys who've been in athletics their whole life, sitting in their chairs because they couldn't they couldn't pull themselves together to walk out. You know, they didn't want to show everybody that they were crying in you know in this public place, and that was really really extraordinary to see what an effect, immediate effect. It had on those people, particularly the ones who, who really were. I mean, a lot of people by the time they heard about the movie knew that there was something exciting at the end, or the dad came back at the end. Or, but for those people who went in clueless, it was a real, uh, you know, catharsis for them. I think. Yeah, I mean, it was. I I saw it in the theater, and then I I we bought it there shortly after, and I remember watching it a lot younger, and, and always remembering, like even as a young kid, like. Of all the movies I'd watched as a kid, for some reason, Field of Dreams was the most emotional one for me. Even as like a like a pre teenager, like I, it was just it got me even as a young boy. So if you're uh, uh, those of you are watching, uh, Dwyer Brown has written uh, this book called If You Build It, and it's about essentially it's about what you know it's about the movie, but it's about fathers too and relationships we have with our fathers. It's a really well written book, and I, I couldn't put it down. It took me four days to read this. I loved it. It's a really fantastic book. Uh, you can get it, link below, um, grab it on Amazon, and also go to DwyerBrown.com, also link below, and you can see, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff you can purchase directly from his site, and also you can see clips of his work, um, including the uh, the clip uh, from Field of Dreams, so definitely check that out. And, and for those of you who are wondering, it's D-W-I-E-R Brown, that's how you spell his name, and... Um, yeah, definitely check it out if you build it. That's the book he wrote. Really good stuff. And um, we'll just get right into the, the the actual interview questions here. It's coming kind of fun to kind of bounce this off, sort of off the cuff. Um, you know, in your book, you talk about how you were unwilling to take advantage of post-release press uh, with the help of a publicist uh, for fear of, fear of spoil, spoiling the ending for those who haven't seen the Field of Dreams. Do you regret that decision in any way? Uh... I mean, I really don't. It's hard to know what difference it might have made. Right. Uh, you know, generally in Hollywood, if you're in a movie, even in a small part like I was in, in a movie that gets seen widely, you suddenly, your your stock has gone up big time in Hollywood and you can then get larger roles in bigger movies or, you know, even leads in, in other small movies. And that's sort of how your career is built, you know. Right. Um, in, in my case... It was kind of interesting because if, if, if I made much publicity about who I played in the movie, I'd have to say, well, I played Kevin Costner's father in the movie. And, of course, Kevin is four years older than me, I think. You know, it, it wouldn't make sense to people. So they'd be like, well, how could you play his father? And then I'd have to say, well, he comes back at the end as a young man, you know. And then it's like, I don't know. To me, it could easily have ruined that cathartic, amazing surprise that people had. And so I just made kind of a game day decision that it, it wasn't worth it for how, I mean, you know, if, if people liked my work in the movie, hopefully they would, you know, uh, find me and for other, other projects that they had in mind. And, you know, it's, I, when you look back on your career, uh, I mean, I've been in this business for 37 years or something. It's, it's easy to see the things like, wow, I wish I had, in, in my case, I think I wish I had. I always try to be friends with my agents, and I think if I had picked agents who were kind of more ruthless and maybe not as likable, <laughs> I might have gotten further. But you know, it's it's you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, and and that's my little rationalization, and it may not be even accurate, but I don't regret that decision. Yeah, I think that, that that's a good point. That you know, we always look back and see kind of the decisions we made, but we made those decisions at the time of where we were at that time, and that, that reflected who we were at that time, and so we don't have any, we shouldn't really have any regrets on any of those things, because really we made the best decision we did uh, for where we were, and so, um, I mean, let's face it, like in everyday life we can always make better decisions, but we can also also make a lot worse decisions too, so um, you, you can't, I think that whatever you did to, to move make that decision was the right one that you for you, and that's important. And I think that there's really no wrong answer in that capacity, you know what I'm saying? And so I think that uh, having that publicist, and you made a good point in your book that, you know, 
it you, you kind of rob them of that surprise at the end of the film if they had not seen it if you say like your your, your part in it and I totally understood that when I watched it and I, 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 I respected your decision to not pursue that angle I, I, I got it quickly I understood it because the end of that movie is is kind of like it wraps it all together and if yeah. and for those people who haven't seen it yet you kind of like take that away if you share that information with them yeah, and I, I think particularly seeing how long that movie has persisted in the American psyche and what a classic it's become, right. uh, you know, none of us expected that. So I, I think in that way it was justified a little that, that people didn't know that, more people didn't know that than we ever expected to see the movie in the first place, I think. Did you expect it to be as, as um, long-lasting as it's been when you made it? I don't think you can ever anticipate that, and I wouldn't have thought that. Even after the movie came out, yeah. I thought that it would still be around 30 years later, and I'd be talking to you and, and, and making appearances all over the country in, in baseball fields. I mean, it's it's kind of ridiculous, but I mean, obviously I'm grateful. I mean, all of us, I think, no matter what field we're in, would love to do something that's remembered. You know, if you're a plumber you want to look back on that, you know, great pipe you fixed or whatever. But, uh, you know, in this case, it's far exceeded my expectations. And, and you know, I, I think most of us did that movie because it was such a sweet story. The, the, the novella that it came from, She Lives Joe, was so beautiful in its own right. And, you know, it was just one of those sweet movies that you do as an artist to feed your own soul. And then you go out and do some of the kind of less uh, rewarding stuff, you know, action pictures or, or, you know, horror movies or whatever, so that you can pay the bills. But, you know, it's rare that you come across one that you do just because it's just so beautiful and you, you want to be a part of it. Absolutely. You know, I always mention, I've mentioned this before with somebody else, is that there are three things we have to, like, want to try to, try to a, a, a adopt in our lives is loving what we do, be good, be good at what we do, and then be appreciated for what we do. And I think that you you captured all those things in that movie, and you know I I, I, I guess the question I asked to you is, and this might come off a little weird, but um, do you ever like how do I say it? It's it's more like do you ever get tired of talking about Field of Dreams, or is it still something you embrace even now? It's been so long, almost thirty years since the film's release. Uh, I don't really, and I understand that. Uh, that, that some artists do, and you know, particularly about some, you know, some line. I'm sure Arnold Schwarzenegger is probably tired of saying "Arduback" or whatever the heck people want you to say whenever they see you. They don't realize that eight million other people have also asked the same question. Right. I think because this movie, to me, epitomized everything about why I wanted to be in the movie business. Right. Not only I got to meet some of my heroes in, in Burt Lancaster and James Earl Jones and and other interesting people like Kevin and, and, and Ray Liotta, it also epitomized what I love about movies in that they can change your lives. I think, sadly, that it's not taken advantage enough of that power that movies have. Frequently we spend a lot of time, I and mean, I've been acting for 40 years. I've got, you know, dozens and dozens of credit that nobody out there watching right now would necessarily remember me from, maybe one or two. But the fact that this one little movie that I was in for five minutes has carried on to where we are today, to the 30-year anniversary of that movie, it's it's very heartwarming to sign, kind of just say, you know, that that was a role that I identified with. I like playing sweet people who have hope and who have, who inspire other people and who have kindness. That also, also is something that doesn't happen very much in, in the movie business. So those roles don't come along that often, you know? Uh, so, I mean, usually movies are made about conflict, you yeah. know, and drama and, you know, and so it, it really was a perfect storm for me of something that I would love to be remembered for. And so I, I embrace that. I mean, not the least of the other reasons being that my father died 30 days before I went to go shoot this movie. Right. And to have left his funeral and gone to Iowa to play a dead father coming back to have a catch with their son was, you know, made this movie that much more, you know, touching to me. 
And whenever I go out to do appearances, places, I end up invariably talking to many people about their dads and how they died too young or how their dad never played catch with them or how their dad came home every night after work and tossed his tie over his shoulder and played catch until the sun went down. And, and we end up hugging each other and they're telling me about their dad reminds me of my dad and I always carry my dad's 1928 mitt with me wherever I go and play catch with it so that my dad's there in, in spirit and so we're linking these fathers and sons together hopefully in a you know a, a, a long line of, of you know that that relationship that's all important and also oftentimes misunderstood and and can be very damaging so in that way, it's very heartwarming for me, and I, I don't get tired of talking to people about it. Yeah, that's, you know, you mentioned that, that you had your dad's glove with you on the, the, the van trip to the field. And is that still a glove that you carry with you when even now? Do you still have it with you? That you, and you still, it's still like a part of your ethos? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can, I mean, I'd have to step off camera to get it, but it's, it's right over there. Okay. And, you know, I, I had it in Cleveland when we met. Uh, oh, you did? Okay. Because I just, I don't know. I mean, I should take better care of that glove because it's kind of getting torn up. I invite people to put their hand in it. I, I think this is a way they can shake hands with my, with my dad, even yeah. though he died 30 years ago. Right. He can, you know, touch something that he touched. And, you know, to me, it's just spreading this message of, hey, we're all trying our hardest. My dad was, and I had some difficult times because he was, you know, he was not very expressive, as, as I think many fathers were in, in the generation of, of, of post-Depression, World War II. Dads were had a lot of other things on their minds and sometimes weren't effusive with their sons the way I might have hoped he would be. But I learned a lot of the reasons why my dad was that way. After, you know, before he died, thank goodness, I think a lot of people don't get that great... Uh, you know, release to, to sort of understand maybe that their dad wasn't trying to be mean. He was just dealing with how he knew fathers to be and, 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 a, and difficult lives and all those things that kind of get in the way of, of expressing ourselves sometimes. But, uh, you know, I, I felt very grateful to have made my peace with my dad before he died. And, and to me, to be able to take that myth with me to the field then, in hopes that it would get into the movie. Of course, I played a catcher in the movie, so right. it gave me a vintage catcher's mitt. But uh, to know that it was there, I felt like my dad was there in that cornfield, you know, with the rest of us. You know, obviously he had just passed, so it, it gave me something. And I think what's odd is I think everybody else working on that film while we were shooting that scene, brought their own fathers to it. it. It was such a scene of, you know, such a beautiful scene. And we shot it every day for two weeks because of the way they wanted to shoot the, the light at magic hour just right. after sunset. There was only this short window. And so we shot the same scene over and over again. Just, you know, my take saying, is this heaven? And then the next day, we'd, it'd be, you know, it'd be too dark that day. The next day, we'd come back and shoot Kevin's, no, oh, it's Iowa. And then back to my scene. So it took two weeks to put together that tiny little four or five minutes of, of movie. And but I think as a result, it it wormed our way. It wormed its way into the hearts of me and the crew and the cast more than other ones that you kind of shoot in in a section and then you move on. So uh, I mean that movie. I, I, people have trouble believing it, but I I get teary eyed when I watch it. You know. And it's me up there, you know, which which says to me that it's much bigger than me. You know, right. I mean, it, I'm not crying because it's a great performance. I'm crying because, oh, my God, who wouldn't want to have a second chance with their dad? You know, meet him as a young man and, and wonder, like, would we get along? Would we like each other even? You know, like if if we really didn't have that, you know, that defined relationship of father up here and son down here would would we be buddies? You know, like what a, what a fascinating thought that is, I think. Yeah, I mean, Field of Dreams is more about a father and son relationship than it is about baseball. You know, it's oh. like baseball is, is um, well, it's such yeah, a... a little baseball is in the movie. It's kind of remarkable. I mean, they're in Fenway for a little bit. Yeah. The old-time players yeah. run about there. But, I mean, as far as actual baseball, there's very, very little in the movie. And it it is a great metaphor to hang everything on. But 
it's certainly not a baseball movie. I, I don't think, you know. And now looking back on it, I, I, I think about that because as a baseball fan of like my whole life, I had to watch the movie and it's still one of my favorite movies of all time. And it never gets old. I'll watch it again and again and again. I'll always be excited about the same scenes. Um, uh, but then I look back and at the end, I'm thinking to myself, it's more about a connection that I have with my father than it is about the sport at all. But the sport is like the, uh, the delivery of that, that connection. To get that connection to happen, we, we, we use baseball as that, that, that force. And I think that that was a that was, you know, as I've, every time I've seen it, I always notice something else about the movie. I don't know, every time you see it, the same movie, you always notice one little extra aspect every time. And yeah, I, like certain parts that I love about that movie, but because I go and, and host screenings when people invite me and I can answer questions afterwards, I get to see the movie over and over again. And in actuality, when the movie's playing is when I could leave the theater and go do something else because people are just watching the movie, you know, I come back for the Q&A, but I... I find it very difficult to leave that movie. You know, I'm like, oh, oh this is one of my favorite parts. I'll just watch this. Yeah. And then you, you go, okay, that part's up. Oh, oh, this other part's coming up. You know, and you, it's just one of those movies that's very hard to walk out of. And, and I found by watching it more and more, I've come to appreciate things that I never used to thought think were, were that interesting. Mm -hmm. And now seeing them over and over again, you can really dissect them and kind of go, wow, Kevin really hit that moment. Like in a way that I don't know if anybody could do that kind of blank stare he can do with, the, with that charming smile and that every man kind of uh, uh, person personality that he embodies so well. Uh, so I, I agree with you that it's it's uh, it's really interesting to see moments that you you'd miss in other uh, viewings. Yeah, it wasn't until I guess 2011 when I started watching it again after a long block of years of not watching it that I've noticed that after a few viewings that every main character got their dreams met at the end of the movie. Except for um, Terrence Mann, his character, we don't know what really happens. He goes into the cornfield, but we know that something happens to where his dream is met in some, some way. But, you know, I noticed that, you know, uh, Ray's character, you know, your character, um, like I said, Terrence Mann, and then uh, Shoeless Joe gets to come back and play baseball. So all the lead characters have their dreams met, you know, and that's that was a really magical place. And then I realized, realized that, um, field of dreams. It's it's the field where everybody's dreams are 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 delivered. And I, I was I, I got that later in life. I didn't get that in my first viewing when I was younger. I got that later. And so it's, it was really important to me. Well, when I started writing the book, what I intended to write was sort of a fantasy about uh, what happens when when Terrence Mann goes into the corn, you know. And I thought about it, I came up with a million different things, like is the corn, is the cornfield just a portal to any place in the world, or is it, you know, is it one way, where are the dead guys when they're not on the field, when they walk back through the corn, are they in heaven, and limbo, and purgatory, I mean, like, I just love thinking about things like that, but I couldn't come up with a viable story that made sense, and I realized, well, what happens is, Terrence Mann writes... Shoeless Joe writes the novel that, that Bill Kinsella wrote that made the movie. Like he's he's just kind of written the backstory of how he ended up walking into the cornfield, and you know, so I mean, it's it's deeper, I think, than than it looks. And 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 another, I don't know if we can go off on tangents, Patrick. Sure. I don't know what's funny about. I'll try to make this short. Whatever. But there's somebody who wrote a very interesting thesis in in literature about Catcher in the Rye versus Catcher in the Corn, that being Shoeless Joe or Field of Dreams, yeah. that I literally play a catcher and that I come out of the corn and that in Catcher in the Rye, uh, Holden has this dream that he is at the edge of a cornfield that drops off precipitously and children are running, playing, and that they're going to run off into the corn and it's his job to catch him. That's why he is the catcher in the rye. He's going to save the people uh, in this, I should say, rye field, not a cornfield, and, and save them. And ultimately, I think the book makes it clear that he can't save them. Holden becomes despondent and sort of realizes that the world is kind of an unfriendly place, and he's sort of unhappy, and that Field of Dreams, Catcher in the Corn, is sort of the opposite. The, the, the field does answer everybody's dreams. It does let them go back in time and make and right wrongs that happen and get a second chance to do things they couldn't do. You know, Moonlight Graham getting a chance to play again so he can right. then go back to being a doctor and, you know, doing what he really should have done. But 
in that way, those two things, you know, catching the corn, catching the rye, I thought it was a kind of, I mean, it was too esoteric probably to put in the book, but doing research for it was fun because I found all these things that, that I really wasn't aware of and, and that are pretty deep thoughts about a movie that plays. You know, what's interesting to me is the, the director, the guy who adapted the script and directed it, Phil Alden Robinson, thought of that movie as a comedy. He's a comedy writer and he wrote it as a comedy. When you look for it in in video stores, it's under fantasy. Uh, most people think of it as one of the best baseball movies ever written. I've always sort of thought of it as a mystery because I think one of the reasons it works so well is that you go on this journey with Ray to figure out, you know, how these people appear, why he got these voices, and he goes to Chisholm, Minnesota, and he goes to Boston, and he and he's constantly trying to find out you know, why Moonlight Graham and all these things. And I think the payoff is so good at the end because if you go on that journey with him to Fenway, to Chisholm, to, you know, through all these things, it makes that catharsis all that more important to you because you've gone along for the ride. You know, you, you know, for the people who, there are people who watch that movie and kind of go, that's the stupidest movie I ever saw. I don't make any sense. You know, dead right. people. Like, but when you go on that journey, I think the payoff is all that much more. But the fact that, People involved with it think of it as a mystery, as a comedy, as a baseball movie, and you know, as as a, a, a fantasy movie is, I, I think, a, a, a very nice compliment to the movie. That it's very hard to put that movie into any kind of category. Yeah, it's a really deep, complex movie, and categorically speaking, as we're saying, it's multi-categorical, depending right. on how you look at it, depending on your perception of it, your viewing of it. Um, how, how you're touched by it emotionally, you, you'll, you'll, you'll place it somewhere. And, and yeah, I mean, t t based on what you just said, it could possibly very well be a mystery, absolutely. But it could also be kind of a drama, in a way. Or you know, a and... road picture, almost, because of the trip that they end up taking. You know, it, it really does kind of go across a lot of genres, you know, and I think that's another reason that it it's, makes it... You want to watch it because you... You don't know. You want to kind of find some. Okay, I want to. I mean, there's a lot of people, and I would even agree that the movie is pretty corny in a lot of places. You know, uh, but I mean, not to not to make a play on words there. Of course, it's corny, but huh. it. You know, it. In some ways, I mean, you couldn't make a movie like that now. I mean, it's obviously very much an '80s movie, but it's still. It's still. It's hard to watch that movie and not kind of tear up at the end. Right. I mean, despite the fact that you can kind of dismiss it as you're watching it. At the end, it still gets you, which I think, again, is a tribute to how beautifully crafted it was by Phil Alden Robinson from this the, the novella by Bill Kinsella that was also, I think, just a great, great story. Very different, but, but really, really wonderful. It's a testament to its timelessness. You know, it's classic. It'll yeah. be classic in the next 30 years. And in the next 30, it'll be one of those, like, carry on into perpetuity. It'll always, there'll always be a large group that will love that movie. You know, I will forever love that movie. Real quick, random question about a scene in the movie that I want to get your take on. When Ray Kinsella is, he's talking to a mechanic about trying to get in touch with where, um, you know, where's Terrence Mann's, where does he live? And he gives him some cash. The mechanic says, Go down this way, and it's the first door without the chicken in the in the window is his. When he goes and finds uh, the door where he's supposed to go into, there's a chicken in the window. Right. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I I don't remember this. Nobody's ever asked this question. Okay. Patrick, you're very proud of yourself. But I think technically, where where they shot that, which uh, where they shoot that in the Galena, uh, Illinois, but they. I think that, that officially that chicken that's hanging is in the building next to where the door to Terrence Mann's goes up above it. Uh, I, that's the only explanation I can offer. Is that it's a different building, but because they're all just continuous, like a you know like a block in New York or whatever, it's uh, it's officially the door after the first one. I don't know. <laughs> I always wondered that. I was like, wait a minute, that one has a chicken in the window, but he's walking into the doorway that's next to that. So I just thought that was interesting. I just wanted to get your take on it. Just ruined the movie for me. Now. <laughs> yeah, this, this interview's over. <laughs> um, in what ways, if any, has your relationship with your father had an influence on your ability to build connections in your uh, in both your personal and professional life? Uh, gosh, that's interesting. Um... I mean, as I talk about at length in the book, 
my dad was just a pretty, you know, stoic character. Yeah. He's very get very much emotion. I, fortunately, as I recount in the book, I, I did have a road trip with him that showed me my father's tears for the first time in my life. This was, you know, a few years before he died. I remember reading about that. It was a revelation to me because, you know, you sort of assume if nobody shows you that side of them, they don't have that side of them, you know, which is, you know, always, I think, a mistake. But it's easy to see. I mean, it certainly was at my age to to think that my dad just didn't have many feelings about things. So um, I suppose in that regard, I'm very different with my kids. Uh, you know, we I mean, and it's, it's generational. We I think most dads these days tell their kids how much they love them. Every time they say goodbye, you know, I hug everybody now. I, I mentioned in the book, too, that my, my family never hugged each other. We, we never said we loved each other. It was just not – I mean, we understood that, I suppose, but we never said it, you know. And becoming an actor, I, you know, had to plumb all my emotions. It was the, by far the hardest thing I had to learn in my life and as an actor was how to express my emotions because I had no experience. I had no – you know, uh, role models in that way. So when I got, found that for myself, I suddenly thought like, why shouldn't I tell my sister I love her? Why don't I tell my mom or my dad, you know, and, and hug them, you know? And it was, I mean, it's a, I, hopefully a funny story in the book where I sort of teach my family how to hug each other, you know, cause it was just like so uncomfortable and so, you know, just, just out of the realm of anybody's understanding. And, I think that, I mean, I've heard from a lot of people from the Midwest and other places where that, that agree that, like, oh, my gosh, it's hard to believe, but we never, I never did that with my parents. I'm trying to do it with my kids. So I guess an answer to your question is I think so many of the things that I've tried to incorporate into my personal life and into my parenting is, uh, at least that part of it is in opposition, I think, sort of to what my father's experience was. And it wasn't really entirely his fault. You know, the generations before us, you know, children were seen and not heard. And, you know, you, you, you didn't tell a kid that you loved them for fear that they would be spoiled. And, you know, it was ridiculous thinking, but prevalent, you know, and, and universal almost. So, uh, you know, uh, my dad was also just a very, you know, smart guy who, could do anything and you know that stuff I have definitely you know taken on and you know people think of me as that kind of person I can build things and I can you know figure out how things work and all that kind of stuff I mean my dad was an architect I have immaculate printing which people comment on all the time so I, I, I have his hands it was one of the things that these are my dad's hands for sure and I love that but every time I look down I see my dad's hands you know usually covered in sawdust and and a few bloody knuckles and everything else. But, uh, you know, so those things are all handed down to me. And I, I, I you know, for better or worse, I look more and more like him as I get older. <laughs> well, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. You, uh, in your book, you talked um, ardently about how you guys, well, your dad bought that house and you were digging out the basement for so many years of your youth and that you just wanted to go out and play sometimes, but you were stuck in the basement digging and, trying to grab you know, pull the boulder out of the you know the one boulder that you ended up uh, carving out for as a as a headstone for for your father's grave i thought that was very touching at the end of the book um as you were going through that you had mentioned that when you get frustrated you'd punch like the the dirt because you were just like gosh i don't want to be down here i want to be out doing something else but you were down there doing that um it i guess how was it until close to that time where your dad took that road trip where you finally like um, uh, got got I, I guess for a lot of kids might might start resenting their father for something like that right they're like kind of robbing their youth right but you kind of took it turned it around and, and 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 you know you and your family did things together it almost brought your, your family closer together it seemed like throughout the book you started the business for I for I bar and then I, I actually was going to tell you that I thought that Barbed Wire was a, an excellent name for that company. <laughs> yeah, my um, sister's Barb, so if we put our names together, it's Barbed Wire. That's <laughs> each other. So. Awesome. You you seem to have turned that around where it didn't turn into resent. It turned into like appreciation more for your family, and it almost brought you guys closer together as as you grew up. Is is that would you say is about correct? About right? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that that's kind of true of uh, any hardship that you go through with other people. Yeah. Back on fondly. I mean, I, I'm, I've I'm recently become a student of hardship because I think that's a lot of what the, the, the characteristics I like about myself were brought on by hardship, some of them imposed by my father, strictness and all that kind of stuff. And I think that our lives have become so easy, and why shouldn't they be? What's the use of modernizing if, if it doesn't make your life easier? Right. But I think some of that hardship has been lost, and it makes it harder, I think, to to bond and to have the kind of characteristics that you can only gain through difficulty and through... I mean, I just finished reading a, a, a history of Sherman's March uh, in the Civil War. And in retrospect, even 20 years later after that, the soldiers talked about what fun they had going across the uh, Georgia countryside and, you know, taking corn and, and sweet potatoes and, you know, like it, like it was a vacation run, you know, and in the facts of it are far from that. It was a horrible, it was wandering through swamps. Most of the march they did was, you know, these horrible, horrible conditions where they're pushing wagons through them. It was pouring rain on them. They're, you know, they're sleeping out in the open, being shot at by rebel skirmishers. And none of that is remembered, you know, they think of Sherman's March partially because it was successful and everything else as, this wonderful time, and and I think that's sort of what happens with hardship in general. Is you look back on it fondly because you, you accomplished something, you bonded, you know, and and you were together, you know, and and all the hardship is is evaporates, right. you know, in, in retrospect. Yeah, it's almost like selective attention into the positive when you complete something that's long term and it's arduous, right? So, like in school, I you know I we go through like so many exams and projects and all this and it's grueling when you're in it sometimes but then you get on the other side and be like I had a great time going through all those things and doing all that and I have all this positive these positive memories associated with it so it's almost like if you survived it it turns into a positive yeah even the startups in 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 you know in, in Silicon Valley I'm sure you know Steve Jobs looked back at that garage that they started out in <laughs> You know, with, with the fondest memories, you know, even though here's this empire that's billions of dollars and all that stuff, but it brings with it all kinds of other baggage. And you look back to that simplicity like, okay, I never had a weekend to myself. I'm digging. I can still smell the moist dirt in my nose as I'm shoveling all day long, seemingly. And I, I, there's a fondness in there. You know, those memories have turned into, you know, what an opportunity I have that a lot of my friends didn't, you know. Right. Yeah, that's, I mean, these are these are good life lessons, I think, for a lot of us. If we can have that that hardship in the beginning, like front-loaded when we're young, so that it builds us and helps us grow character as adults. In a lot of ways, it helps us become more productive, more successful, more well-adjusted, balanced adults. And that's all good stuff. Totally. And so, it makes those baseball games, at the end of the day, all that much sweeter by the fact that you haven't seen daylight <laughs> you know, all day in the basement. So, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with you. It's hard to do. I mean, it's hard for me to enforce hardship on my children. You know, I don't have to, you know what I mean? My dad had us working in the basement cause he couldn't afford to hire anybody else to dig it. You know, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, he was trying to be hard on us, but he, he chose to build this house. And I, I know in retrospect, I thought he just did that cause he was crazy or something, you know? <laughs> But he did that so that we would all have to join together and do this. He didn't have that in his childhood, and he wanted to have a place where we all created something together. Now, you're, when you're young, you don't understand that. Why do I want to build a house, Dad? I just want to go play, you know? You don't have any concept of that, but he did. And only when you get older do you realize, oh, okay, he took this on because he didn't want to raise us in a city. He didn't want to, you know have no yard he wanted us to you know we had 52 acres that we just you know we would just disappear on nobody was watching us we would go find ancient junkyards where people used to take their you know just the garbage out of their house in the 1800s because there was no place else to put it and we would go through and find bottles and you know it was an adventure and totally. that to me it was oppression to him it was an adventure and i'm, I'm glad to have lived long enough to have thanked him for that you know frequently that doesn't happen where you get that knowledge while you can still 
convey it to to your dad or whatever. And so I, I I like to encourage as many people as I meet on the you know on the road to to tell their dads you know remind them of all these crazy things that you hated them for and why you don't you know have to hold on to that anymore. Yeah, it took me until like my early thirties to like. Um, forgive my father for some of the things that he put us through at a young age. And, and then I just accepted my father and things were just automatically better between he and I, you know, and well, quickly just a switch in your mind. You can turn that around once you get to express it and own it. And, you know, and sometimes no, may, a little more why maybe they did that, how quickly you can just turn it into a positive memory rather than a, a, a grudge, you know? Yeah. And my, my relationship with him instantly improved. And it was, I, I don't, I can't remember specifically what the catalyst for that change was, what this, what caused that change. But I, I will say that under significant degrees of, 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 of traumatic experience, there's something that changes in you. And, and in my life at that time, I was kind of enduring a lot of very hard, hard time. And so I, it kind of makes the stuff that we once thought was significant trivial. And it turns our perspective and makes us appreciate those things much more because a lot of that stuff is more important than we think it is, I think, when we're going through it and it's hard for us. Right. So, yeah. if you're still watching things, I want to just plug his book. This is uh, uh, If You Build It. He, uh, Dwyer Brown is, is essentially wrote this book about Field of Dreams and about his relationship with his father, but it also is about re just relationships with fathers in general. Really amazing book. Uh, you can click below to grab a copy for yourself. Um, Dwyer Brown, this is just an awesome, awesome uh, time for us to talk about this. I, I really got a lot out of your book. I wanted to jump into this next question here. Early on in the book, you, you mentioned growing tired of being cast in roles where your character dies. Um, and as a result, you said a prayer to ask for a role that would be both meaningful and that you could use to help others, which I thought was amazing, by the way. Um, you seem to have been perfectly cast for the role of John Kinsella. With regard to the similarities between the role and your personal upbringing, it would appear to some the, that your prayer was answered. Has this had any impact on you spiritually? And if so, can you share how? Uh, yeah, that's a pretty good question. I, I guess, I mean, I was raised in the church. I, I was raised Methodist. My, my mother mostly was, you know, a very religious sort of person. I, I rejected church as a young kid. It was another, you know, kind of point of friction for my parents and myself. I, I mean, of course, I had to go to church every Sunday, but when I got to be old enough, I had pretty much rejected. I, I, I couldn't help but see the hypocrisy in in religion and in the church itself. You know, all this preaching about love, but their kind of rejection of, of people who I, I didn't think Jesus would reject. And, you know, all that kind of stuff that I think people go through. But I did, I think... I, again, I think that seed was planted early. I've always kept a spiritual nature. I look at it as the universe. We're all part of God. You know, we're all our own little place. And, and you know, we work together or sometimes not. But, you know, it's all energy that we're, that, that we're all here. So uh, in that way, I think what I do now with, with as a result of the movie, that is writing my book and making these appearances and, to me, I think of it sort of as my mission, you know, my purpose in life. My mom, you know, she was one of those church people who would maybe once a year send me a letter about like Dwyer, you know, or she didn't call me Dwyer, but Ricky, I really love you, but, you know, I wish you had more purpose in your life. I wish you, you know, look at this church video and all this stuff. You know, she was constantly trying to bring me back into the flock, you know, and fortunately with my mom, she lived long enough. I mean, she just died last year. She was 94, but... I got a chance really to have more full relationship with her because I think she came to understand and appreciate that my ministry or whatever you want to call it, I, I, I cringe at that very word, but that it was, I'm doing as much for people's healing through writing this book and hugging dads that I find who, who can't, can't give themselves that forgiveness and that love. You know, I, that's what I do and I like it and it helps them. And, you know, so in that way, I think that movie and the book and the book tour and all this stuff has, has just helped me embrace that. You know, that's what I do. I don't feel the way I did when I was acting 
I was always trying to be somebody, you know, I, I wanted to be more macho looking or I didn't want to be such a nice guy. I wanted people to think I was sexy rather than, you know, look at me and go, Oh, what a sweet guy. You know, I, and I was always trying to be something that Hollywood would then appreciate. And, you know, and in this, I don't have to be anybody but myself. I, I like people. I like talking to people. And so I just go there and talk to people. And when they tell me things, I, I just reflect back what, what I'm hearing from them. And it's kind of great. And so in that way, it has been, it has just slowly opened my life to what I always wanted to do, which was, you know, sort of be able to help people, as I, as I mentioned in that, in, in my prayer, you know, uh, I, I like kind of being people's dads who lost their dad or whatever. And for a few minutes, they can look in my eyes and tell me the things that they never got a chance to say to their dads or, say it to somebody who isn't their dad. It's sometimes very hard, you know, if you've never said you love you to your dad, looking in his eyes and saying, uh, I love you, dad, is difficult. Whereas I'm, I'm an actor from Hollywood who played this part who they probably have an easier time communicating with me. I, I swear I've heard stories from people that they've maybe never told anybody else in their lives. And here I am just a stranger coming into town. But I do sort of feel sometimes like I'm a priest and I do these little father confessionals with people. They tell me amazing stories and I take them in and, you know, respond if I can, tell them, you know, Hail Mary, do, you know, three, you know, whatever. Uh, but it, it, it to me is, is really given my, my later career kind of a, a different sense of purpose. Yeah, that's um, interesting that you, you're, you're, a lot of your purpose is exactly what you're doing, which is adding value to other people that relate to you and, and your and a character that you played in a movie that you were perfectly cast for in that movie. And so it's, you know, you are, you are, you, you, you very much have, um, had your prayer answered, you know, you, you're, you're helping others in that way and into perpetuity in your whole life. You're now this, 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 this gentleman that, that people can come to and relate stories with almost automatically. And in your book, you, you bring in um, anec anecdotes, like kind of peppered about of, of these situations uh, that where you meet people just in and around in, in your life. Um, and I thought that was very endearing that you added those stories in. And I thought it was very um, clever that you changed the font of those stories so that you knew that, that I was going to change mentally from the story to these these anecdotes, and I thought that was that was a really clever, from a design perspective, I really appreciated that. Um, well, you know, it's interesting, I was just thinking about this the other day, was uh, that I didn't want to do that. I, I, in my, when I was writing the book, I had this idea to put one of those little lines across the page, and then just go into the other stories. Okay. And, and that, they couldn't do it. The publisher just said it, you know, and I was kind of broken hearted. I didn't know what I was going to do. <laughs> and then I came up with I thought, oh, if we change the font, you know, and I, it was, it took a long time for me to get used to it. I just didn't like it. You know, I kept looking at it and I thought, oh, this looks weird. It looks like it was an accident that somebody, but it ended up being really, it worked really well. But it again, it came out of hardship because I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Yeah. I had to come up with something else. And if you read the book, the movie was fraught with difficulty and the producers from, from LA sent somebody to Iowa just to make sure that the director wasn't going to have a nervous breakdown. That's how difficult the really? shooting. Yeah. They were fairly certain that he was just going to freak out and they would stop production. I mean, fortunately he, he didn't. And he, you know, he, he, he finished it and brilliantly, but there were so many difficulties. And to me, that's another important thing about that movie is that here's this classic movie that we're talking about 30 years later. And there were a dozen, at least, different times when the whole thing could have could have fallen apart. Right. I mean, at least of which was the drought that was happening, the corn wouldn't grow. Right. It isn't a big deal, ordinarily, to farmers, because it'll come eventually, and it'll just grow later. But we're shooting a movie. We can't have players walking out of corn that's knee-high. <laughs> right. So they had to go to Plan B. They had ordered silk corn stalks I remember. that they were going to fly in if we couldn't get the corn to grow. And, you know, and then, then they watered the corn, and of course it did grow. And by the time they were going to shoot the scenes with Kevin in the field, the corn was two feet taller than Kevin, so he's walking through the corn, you can't even see him. So 
Here's another hardship that's come about because of the solution that you created to fix the first hardship. And, you know, of course, they built a platform for Kevin to walk on between the rows of corn so that he would be, so you could see him. And But, you know, it was just one of those after another. And yet, here's this wonderful movie that that you don't see any of that, but is there. It's, you know, like even the great sculptures, you know, the sculptors of, of, of ancient times, you know, would find a piece of granite and then accidentally it would crack in half and they'd have to start over or those kind of things that only inform the final product. All that hardship is brought in there and, and, you know, it's really kind of love or, or creative expression that ends up being what is, 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 uh, projected by all that hardship. So anyway, I digress. Those, no, those are, those are great points. Um, you mentioned that, that the movie was, like I said, you said fraught with, with hardship difficulties the one that stood out to me the most in the book is when you talked about um, how you, you, you guys took three takes to film the cars at the end to line up. And then you said, I mean, so much had to be arranged logistically for that to happen. And you were worried about dropping the baseball on every time you were throwing it. And I can't imagine the kind of pressure that you were under to ensure that you were catching. Because I know that those old vintage catcher's mitts are hard to catch with, right? So oh, yes. you had that. It's like catching with a concrete block on your hand. Yeah, totally. Like it's so ungiving. And you could hardly tell when the ball hit it other than the, Duh! and then you've got to make sure your hand's on top of the ball because, yeah, yeah. And I hear, I can hear and feel the helicopter right. up here shooting this shot that I know we can't get another one up because it's too dark. Right. And this is the final take. And you never, I mean, you're playing catch with somebody, you're not thinking like, oh, I hope I don't drop the ball. You know, you right. Say, but, in this instance, it was like, oh, my God, how stupid would that look? If we catch it and drops out of my hand, I'd be like, uh, sorry. You know, totally. so, yeah, it is kind of funny. The other things that could have gone wrong, I'm worried about dropping the ball. <laughs> the uh, the final take where you had, you guys had three takes, and then when the footage was re reviewed, they, it was found that those first two takes weren't even recorded. Right. And that you almost didn't do this the third take, but then you didn't. It was the, it was the one. I can't, I mean... The, I, the how yeah. lucky that is is just it's it's un uncanny. Yeah. I didn't know that till I was researching the book because I mean those in those days when you shot film there was no video feed you know the way they have now where you can watch it you know and know that it's you know it's all done perfectly well because you're watching the actual finished product. But back then they had to send it off to the lab and it was at least a week before you'd get to see the dailies and know if you got it uh, you know but. In that case, they didn't, you know, it, it, by then we'd wrap the shoot. If it hadn't had, if it hadn't taken that last shot, uh, you know, they would have had to do something completely different. I, I, I doubt they would have reshot that because it was by far the most expensive shoot of the, of the or uh, shot of the movie, right. you know. Uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty remarkable. So intense. Um, let's, let's talk about your book for a minute. Um, when did you start writing the book, and how long did it take you before you had at least a rough draft? Uh, I had always wanted to write a book, uh -huh. and I just could never think of, like, what, what could I write about that's, that somebody else couldn't write about better? You know, it was kind of the, the critic in me telling me, oh, you're not good enough to write a book, basically. You know, and I, anybody who's tried to write stuff knows that that critic, every insecurity you ever have comes out when you try to start writing a book. Or you know, do any creative endeavor, but uh, so I, uh, but I realized uh, about two and a half years before the 25th anniversary. So this is in 2013, probably. I thought, oh, this uh, no, yeah, it would have been part of that. Anyway, I thought, oh, I could write a book about Field of Dreams. I have all these stories of people who have come up to me and told me amazing things, and there's nobody else in the world who's had that happen to them. You know, I mean, I guess at the time I thought probably it happened to Kevin and, and the director and all that stuff. But yeah. I talked to them. They said, you know, when you run into Kevin Costner in a grocery store, do you have a million things you want to ask him rather than feel the dreams? When people see me and recognize me from that movie, that's what they want to talk to me about. So I probably got the lion's share of those, you know, interactions with, with fans of the movie. So I started writing those down. And then that, of course, made me think about my dad. And I, that wasn't part of the original intention. Like I said, I was going to write about what happened to Ter Terrence Mann when he went into the cornfield. And when I couldn't get any traction in that, I started reworking some of these stories that I'd written in my notes over the years. 
and and started telling them, which was kind of difficult to tell because I only have it from their point of view, so I can't I can't elaborate very much on their experience. Only write down the words that I remember them telling me, mm-hmm. and I take notes about. So, uh, but I started writing about my dad, and then I started writing stories about filming the things that I remember from filming, and I started doing research about things that I hadn't kept track of, but like the shooting schedule. I, I'd forgotten what exact day I went there and what, you know, I was originally there for three days. That's what I was, my contract was for three days. Fly in, shoot that scene, leave. And only because they changed their mind to, to shoot it at, at magic hour where where all the, uh, the light is just exactly where they wanted it. That's how I ended up being there two weeks, you know. And, you know, I got to see all kinds of things. I saw on the, on the casting list, which surprised me, Jim Carrey, the, you know, famous comedian actor, right. auditioned for my part. Mm. So that's the only part maybe in my life that I've ever beaten out for, but uh, I'm grateful. But, you know, it would have been an entirely different movie, I think, with Jim Carrey as, as, as John Kinsella. But, uh, you know, it was, it was, you know, researching the, the uh, for, for the book that I started to learn all these other details and all kinds of things that, refresh my memory and you know talking to phil robinson i thought we only did one take of that final scene i was sure that kevin agreed with me uh that we only shot one scene but you know phil is nothing if not very uh uh, specific about his memories and he said no no, we shot three and and then he told me the story about how those two other takes the first two takes had been ruined because the uh because of a you know operator error and that the final take so that was ended up being this great story that i I wasn't as aware of being an actor on the set. Like I said, I was worrying about dropping the ball. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah. So anyway, I wrote for about, I uh, probably wrote for two full two years, just in little four or five page segments. I, I was part of a little writing group here in this little small town that I'm part of. We're not professional writers, just people who would bring in stuff every week and you'd read your six pages and people would give you feedback and, had a help of a really, the teacher of that class, uh, Deb Norton, was very helpful in letting me kind of, uh, or uh, I guess putting it into a heroic journey, the typical heroic journey in literature of a, of a uh, you know, young uh, warrior who doesn't think they're good enough and then is forced through some circumstance to go out into the world and overcome these foes and then comes back home with new knowledge. That's sort of a very thumbnail sketch of a heroic journey. So she helped me to kind of frame it in those lines, which really helped uh, because uh, as people who've read the book know, I, I sort of try to tell three different stories. And the hard part, once I'd finished with the rough thing, which took me two years, was trying, I was going to try to tell one story and then another and another, and that didn't work. And I, I was trying to weave them together, but the climax point of the three stories are in different places so that would make a very kind of rocky anyway it, i learned so much from having to put together that book and fortunately had the help of friends and a few good editors who just helped me kind of whittle away and tell the story in a way that and, and you know i had dreams of myself I, I like short chapters in books because i like you know to be able to get somewhere quickly so i was good insisted on that I love maps in books. There's no reason to have a map in Field of Dreams, but boy, if I, if I could have figured out how to put one in there, I would have. You know, and uh, you know, I, I, the acknowledgments are kind of lengthy. I got a lot of grief about that. I think as a writer, you're supposed to just kind of gently thank these people and get it over with. I wrote a whole other, <laughs> practically a chapter about all the people who helped me because it meant so much to me. And I thought, you know what? This is my book. I might not write another one. I don't want to look back and say, I wish I had been more effusive in my thanks for all the people who helped me. So, uh, you know, so I made some choices that, you know, I mean, I was going to sprinkle another thing. This is kind of, I don't know, I'm I'm really talking your ear off. No, 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 you're good. I have pictures in the book, photos from my childhood and from the movie. Yeah. I had imagined putting them on pages throughout the book. Sure. As you're talking about this thing, there would be the, the picture. I did that. I had the whole book set up that way, and I realized how distracting pictures are. You know, like they say, they tell 10,000 words. Well, I know when I'm reading a book, I skip to the pictures. You know, I usually do that first or whatever, you know. like So I found that if I, if I found a good rhythm in a story and I put a picture, you know, at the pivotal point where I wanted to put it, it – took the momentum out of the story, you know, like suddenly I find myself like, oh, I'm reading, I turn the page, oh, there's a picture, oh, look, 
oh yeah, there he is, that's what he talked about. Okay, great. And then you go back and by then you've lost sort of some of the magic that you created in that story. So I ended up doing what probably a billion other people in <laughs> publishing have done. You put like all the pictures in a little section in the center. That way, if you are looking for clarity, you can look ahead. But if not, hopefully you're telling a story in a way that nobody wants to stop in the middle of it and look at a picture of you when you're in eighth grade to corroborate what you're already telling. And, you know, I mean, but that to me was like such an obvious thing, but you don't understand those decisions when you, until you write a book of your own and you're, and you put yourself in the reader's place and, and try to figure out, okay, what do I want to get out of this? And how can I best tell this story? And anyway, that's a long answer to a short question. It took me two years to write it. I had, I, I, because I had this deadline of the 25th anniversary uh, and they were going to do something at the field. I mean, I guess I didn't know that when I started, but as it got closer, I knew I had to finish it because I wanted to release it at the 25th anniversary there that the Today Show was going to be there with Bob Costas and Kevin was going to be there. And, you know, it just seemed like an opportunity I couldn't pass up. But I mean, I got that book from the publisher. It, it wasn't even done when I started to Iowa. I had to have it sent directly so that it arrived like about the same time my plane did. So I was kind of like, I got the book. You know, like, I mean, it, it was another one of those hardship things that now makes me laugh. But at the time, I, I was sweating bullets. Like, well, you got a book? Where is it? Um, right. Here's a, here's a book similar that I, I, I actually took a colored piece of paper that looked like the cover and wrapped it around another book that I had around the house so that I could say, oh, here it is. You know, and God knows that they open it and find that it's, you know, the, lo- the road less traveled. Right. So, man, yeah. and, uh, but until my book got there, it was just, it was just one of the you know crazy last minute things if I hadn't had that hard deadline never would have done it that, that to me I'm a guy who responds to that one so that was that was big for me um like I said structurally speaking in in your book you you you've I like the short burst of content because you said this just a, a, earlier on you said you know you like to feel like you made some progress when you pick up a book um, I really liked that there were two and three pages to get through little chunks, and um, that I think allowed me to finish it in four days. You know, if they were long twenty-page chapters, I think it would just take a little bit longer because you don't see a progress and you kind of feel overwhelmed. So I think, from the structure uh, standpoint, writing it and breaking it up like that was very smart to do that. I really appreciated that a lot. Thank you. You know what? I wrote it because I like having a short little burst, and it had that effect. I think. I think the people who get the most out of the book are the ones who can read it straight through. Mm-hmm. And because the chapters are short, that was sort of what the what the end result ended up being is, I mean, there's three stories woven together. So you read one, and then the next one starts off on this other tangent. So I think as a reader, you can't help but go, oh, what's he talking about now? And then by the time you get halfway down the page, you're already almost through that next chapter. So I'll just finish this one. And I've had so many people tell me that they read it in two and three and four days. And I think it helped me. I think a better writer can sustain that curiosity, setting a book down for, you know, daytime so you can read it at night, you know, and you takes you, you know, three weeks or a month or something to read it. But I think those short chapters had an inadvertent uh, uh, effect of making people continue reading, which I think helped me. Yeah, it was great. I was putting away like 50, 60 pages a, a night. It was just such a great, I mean, I couldn't, I would like read 20, 40, 20 to 40 pages and I go and read another like 30 pages like somewhere else in the day and I just liked how fast of a read it was. It's just really an excellent book. Um, what was the most difficult part of writing the book? Well, there's so many. <laughs> I know, totally. Just sitting down, anybody who knows who's tried, I'll tell you what's the hardest, is not judging what you just wrote yesterday. Okay. That was an important thing that my coach helped me with is write it Put it away. Do not look at it the next day if you can. You know, so writing in short bursts like that, for me, having that group also helped because I would take this crap and I would be humiliated with, but I knew I had to take something to class, so I'd take it anyway. And people would be like, oh my God, that's great. Or, oh, if you just did this, it would fix it. And, you know, so getting that, getting a more uh, objective critic's point of view regularly was very helpful. 
because I've written a bunch of stuff in the past. I just never finished anything. For 30 years, I'd written, started screenplays and, you know, all kinds of plays, all kinds of stuff that I would write. But I would get so critical of it when I look back at it in a day or a week or whatever that I would just be like, oh, this is terrible. Anybody on the street, my dog could write a better story than that. You know, you, you, your, your self-critic is the hardest thing to overcome, you know, and, and – my, my coach, Deb Norton, wrote a book about that. Uh, I think it's called Part Wild, but it's sort of about taming that that critic that's going to just eat you to bits. You've got to let them do what they do well, but not let them undermine the overall project. I would say if any, any one thing that was by far the hardest thing was to kind of keep going. In my book, the next hardest would have been taking these three stories and trying to figure out how to make a logical, followable story out of all of it that, you know, climaxes in the right place and all that kind of stuff. That, that was also difficult. Yeah, the process of writing and then letting it marinate for a while and then coming back to it and like, well, I can maybe change this to make deliver this information in a different way that makes, you know, more sense the way that how the book kind of turns out. So... I, I can respect that, like walking away from it, you know, think about it for a while. Kind of like, don't react immediately, kind of think about your reaction first. Maybe write that email and then go do something for an hour and then come back and reread the email and see if you, you still need to even send it, you know, and that, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. from, from an email standpoint, just like as a related to like writing and letting it sit kind of arrangement, you know, just, just anything you're writing and responding. And um, I guess it comes down to the value of not acting so quickly, you know. Yeah. Another difficulty in, in the modern day where you can have a lot of expressions for your art. You know, if you're a musician, you can put something up on YouTube, or if you're a filmmaker, you can, I mean, immediately, that's that's new. I mean, you know, when I was a kid, I mean, if you wanted to shoot a movie, you had to buy film, which was very expensive. You, you know, it, it, part of this streamlined process, the challenge is figuring out how you work as a creative artist. I had to figure out that I could only write like in the middle of the night. If sun was shining and just something I could procrastinate, go do, I would do it. So I trained my body. I would wake up sometimes one, two, three in the morning, completely dark, nothing going on, sit down with my little lamp and, you know, just write because if my wife was up, I was going to have fun with her or, you know, I, you know, it was just too many distractions. And I have a disciplined enough character to, to do that, but I had to figure out what worked for me, and then and then exercise that. You know, if uh, now, uh, I mean, one of the things I've integrated was really when I write stuff now, I, literally the thought happens in my head like, oh, I should just do this email later. It's stupid. I, I'm writing a speech now for this thing, and I just hate it most of the time. But I I literally have the little voice that says, write this, Dwyer. This isn't the finished product. You're going to fix this, but this thought is important, and you have to get it down. Even if you're clumsy getting it down right now, you're going to go back and fix it. So it, it it's so cool how quickly that will become part of your little mantra instead of this sucks, close the thing, go back to bed, go outside, you know, forget this book, you don't need it. There's other writers who are much better than you. All that stuff that your your critic will will put in your brain that's Really, it's hogwash. It's not. It's not even true. Right. But it's just that critic trying to keep you safe. But it also prevents you from being great and being, you know, expressive and all that kind of stuff too. Right. So it's like that personal trust, knowing that you've done something great in the past, you're going to do it again in the future. Right. So like, yeah. I can kind of relate this. When I was in business school, there was one semester where I took. Uh, actually, I was an undergrad. I was taking 21 credit hours, and I remember thinking to myself. Okay, I've gotten this far in my undergrad. I've done like, you know, a, a, a block of semesters and I've, I've excelled. I can do this semester. Knowing how much I have to go ahead of me, I know that I'll get it done one thing at a time because I've done it before. So it allowed me to like curb my stress and, yeah. you know, like trust that I'll do it again. I'll replicate those results again, even though I'm taking a bigger load. Um, same with writing. You, you trust that you're going to be able to produce a good result even though at some points you like doubting whatever it is you're writing, you trust that you're going to, you know, tighten up the loose ends and get it out the door. It's just, you got to have to learn to get to that point in your own 
your own your own your own self. Yeah, the easy metaphor is a batting slump. You know, those guys they, they haven't had a hit for fifteen at bats. Right. You could easily think, well, I haven't done it fifteen times, I'm gonna do another. But when you've played enough, you can say, Look, I you know, I I'm batting, you know, my career average is higher. I'm gonna get back to that. I you know, and you just keep taking pitches until you get a hold of one mm-hmm. and then you go from there, but it's a, it's a very apt metaphor for, yeah, you do eventually kind of go, okay, made it through college. I can make it through, ma- you know, I can get a master's degree or I can, you know, I had, to, I had to write a 10 page dissertation. I can write 15 and then 20 and then, you know, so yeah, it's, it's interesting that that critics place in our brains is, is, you know, it's just hidden in there, but boy, it's the worst place for it to be is in your head because you can't get rid of it. Absolutely. We're talking with uh, Dwyer Brown. He played the character John Kinsella in the book, uh, in the movie Field of Dreams, and this is his book, uh, If You Build It. It's about the movie and his experiences with his father growing up and the movie Field of Dreams, so definitely check it out. Also linked below. Uh, Dwyer, we're going to move into this next question here of kind of about the process of you scouting publishers for your book. Um, can you talk about that process and any challenges you experienced along the way? Yeah. Let me start with a quote from the movie, or from the book, Shoeless Joe. Okay. One of the titles says, some things it's better not to know. This has been another favorite little theme of mine, but the reason it's appropriate here is because I didn't know anything about writing books or about publishing or any of that stuff. I went in writing on, I just insisted on writing longhand on a tablet. It took me probably a month before I realized how stupid that was. And that everybody said, use a computer because, and what's so great is you can, take a paragraph and move it to someplace else. That's, that's when I write, it's never in the right order. One of the longest things is trying to figure, oh, this belongs down here, oh, right. this. And so anyway, so I now just write on the computer. I learned that lesson early on. But what I didn't know about publishing was that when you submit your uh, manuscript to a publisher, if you can find one, you know, they're harder and harder to find because of a million different other reasons. But... Um, it, they, they take it like like a movie. They take almost a full year to kind of get all the stuff together. I mean, if they if they have to release it for for other reasons, but for the most part, it takes them a year to kind of edit your script, manuscript and get it all perfect. You know, hire somebody to put the book, you know, the book jacket together and all this stuff. So here I finish, you know, two and a half months before the the 25th anniversary thing is happening in Dyersville, Iowa. It's, you know, the Today Show is going to be there for, and you know, and I'm. And I go online, and it said, oh, a year. And I'm like, I don't have a year. There's not going to be a 26-year reunion to the movie. Right. I'm like, oh, God, what am I going to do? I've done all this work, and I'm not going to be able to. You know, so I thought, well, i would always known in my mind what I wanted the cover to look like. I, that, I pictured that before anything. You know, I knew it was going to be this particular black and white shot from the film, and... You know, and my wife, fortunately, is pretty artistic, so she put together a cover for me, you know, using some corn stalks and, and you know, doing all, she's just great, but, so she, she did that, and then I thought, like, well, but it really needs some editing, and so, you know, in, in this two and a half months I had left, I found a couple editors, freelance editors, who I said, look, I don't know if you understand this story, but here's my thing, what do you think, you know, and in my mind, there's a few chapters in there that I thought, I don't know if this belongs, I don't know, but I wasn't, you know, some of them I'd taken out, but certain ones I was like, I don't know, does this work, can I make this? And so fortunately, they gave me good advice. I took it to one editor, they completely went through it, then I took that and took it to another editor, I thought, you know, I'll, i got to do this as fast as I can, and, I, you know, I paid them individually to, to um you know, do this, and then, you know, I started my own little publishing company, I named it after my mom, who, who was then in her 90s, and was always the one responsible for my love of literature and writing and all that, so I called it Elsie Jean Books, named after my lovely mother, and, uh, and I sort of published it myself, and, but I was adamant, when somebody said self-publishing, I was like, oh, I don't want one of those stupid books that you can tell has been self-published and is the cover looks all cheesy and you know so i had to be my own quality control and kind of go okay 
I want a nice font. I want nice paper. You know, because if you self publish, they're going to put it on the cheapest paper, the crappiest, easiest thing for them to do, you know. So it requires, again, your own, you've got to be your own best advocate and insist on a look and educate yourself. Go out there and look at books. I mean, I, I would love to have done a hardback and, you know, there's things I love about right. certain books, you know, the ragged ed, edge, you know, uh, pages and, but, you know, I, I had time constraints, I had money constraints, I, I, went on, I, I did a, a, fund me, a GoFundMe page, got enough money to publish the book and, and start a book tour. And so it was, again, hardship and, and improvising and plan B and all that kind of stuff that you don't want to have happen. You want it to be like easy, you hand it to them, they fix it, they send it out, you're a bestseller, you know. But you're, you're going to be hard-pressed to find anybody that that's happened to, it's always a, uh, you know, it's, it's a rugged, tough road and you, you just have to stay focused on the, you know, your end point and keep plugging away. And, uh, you know, you learn a lot on the way. Yeah. This is, um, this is really impressive that you, you, I didn't know that this was your, your own. Now I'm looking at the, as you're talking, your, your wife did the cover. I'm looking over at the book, looking at the cover and it's, I mean, it's impressive. It's, Really well. I wouldn't have guessed this was a self-published publication. It just—it looks very professionally done. You know, I, I authored a book in 2016 that took me three years from pulp to print, and I remember thinking that um, I was learning so much along the way. The ISBN numbers I was learning about, like how to create those. Um, this one's just really, really well done. And you know, it's regardless of your self-pub or if you're through a publication house. You get a product into the ethos that's there long after you're gone, and that's I think that's there's a lot to be said for leaving your 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 legacy in the world, and this is just one way to do it. You know, you've got the movie, you've got the book, you've got your acting career, um, you're out there, you know, forever, and that's that's there's there's that's important I think for us to find out, you know, identify our skill so that we can identify how we can fit into the world some way to give value somehow. Um, and this book is, has really captured that in, in a lot of ways. And I, I, I really have a lot of appreciation for this, this work that you've produced. Um, big fan. Huge fan. Um, Thank you, Patrick. Let me say one other thing. Yeah. I, I haven't told anybody it's self-published, so I'm coming out on your show because there's a, there's a you know, there's a, uh, uh, what do they call it? A, uh, stigma? Stigma attached to self-published books. You know, obviously I couldn't find a publisher, so I had to publish it myself. But, I mean, my particular reason was because of my time constraints right. and you know nobody wants to know that it's self-published book so I tried like I said to make it look as much you know as much like the real deal as I could make it so uh, the other thing that got me is the internet's invaluable but I read on there how little people make even with a best-selling book oh, yeah. just take the lion's share of that for the hard work that they do in making it a mass appeal I knew my book was sort of going to be a cult following, a, a fringe little people who loved that movie and would be interested in finding out more about it. And so I knew that I might not benefit from all the money I would be giving a publishing company to try to create an audience for this that was going to be potentially limited by you know, just the people who were interested enough to read a book about it. And what's great is, though, I keep almost all the profits from the book, you know, ones that I don't, you know, donate to charities right. or whatever, I, I get that money because I'm doing it all myself. And I've always been kind of like that. This is probably another legacy of my dad forcing me to help him build a house in the middle of nowhere is I'm all ready to do everything myself because I've learned that you can do it. You know, you, if you put your head down, educate yourself, you know, I'm, I'm a capable person, you know, and so I, as a result, I also, I, I wanted to write a book, and I wrote a book, I can't tell you, I, sometimes you have dreams that, you know, like when I got my first acting job, that was a dream of mine, but it made me want the next acting job, and then right. a bigger acting job, and then this, and you know, whatever, I wrote a book, and I had been trying to find that desire to write another book, I've started a few things, but I, that dream is accomplished, it's like, taking something really big off your bucket list. Mm -hmm. I wrote a book, and I'm proud of the book. It's not a great book. 
I, it, it's very good, and it does very well just what is best about me, you know, and and that to me is, is a real accomplishment. So, so I, I can't tell you how much I would encourage all of you to just do those dreams. You know, they seem like they're impossible, they're going to take you forever, but I swear when you get it done, you A, learn all kinds of stuff, and if you do want to continue, you know so much more. Secondly, sometimes it's just like, that's what I needed. I wanted to write one book, and, and that's, and I did it. You know, I, I can cross that off. If I get the urge to write another one, I will, but I was surprised how quickly that was like, like I spent my whole life writing all this stuff that I thought I'd finish, never did. Finally, when I finished it, it's like, okay, done, you know. So, um, first of all, your book's not just good, it's great, okay? It's a fantastic book. I loved this book. You have a really almost innately, um, how do I say it? The way you describe things is just, it's almost like magical. I can't explain it. You describe things in such a, such a detailed way. The way you talked about, there's like, there was a, what was it called? The... What was the the, the, the porta potty that was off the end of your oh, acting? The honey house. wagon. <laughs> yeah. You, you described that thing in such detail, and I remember thinking to myself, I was reading, I was like, man, he took all this time to describe this thing, and it's kind of a benign, you know, like <laughs> like tangible thing, but he he talked about it in such a way that had me yeah. so deeply focused on this thing, and I'm like, man, it really it was engaging for me, and I really liked that. But that was just one instance of many in your book where you were able to describe things in such a detailed manner. When you were sitting in the, um, I guess the the hair the, the salon room, oh, and right, just right. a couple of chairs over was James Earl Jones, and he reaches over and says, "Hi, I'm Jimmy." And you were so shocked because you were trying to you're trying to think about how you were going to introduce yourself to him, how you were going to tell him, it, it, like how, that that whole that whole delivery, and and you described that in such a such a great way. It felt like I was there, and I really like that about the way you write. I really got a lot out of that. Those those little situations, like you took minor situations and you made them really important in the book, and I, I really appreciated that a lot. Well, thank you, Patrick. You know what's interesting about that? When I was writing my little writing group, would always talk about. I think in in writing they call that your voice. You know, the voice that you write with. I I have no concept of that because it's my voice. You know right. what I mean? Like I. They would all say, oh, it's just such a interesting, homey, or warm kind of, and it's just how I write, you know what I mean? Like, it, it was very interesting to get compliments about something that I wasn't aware I was doing or could do differently if I wanted to, it seemed to me that, you know, uh, I, I, I'd heard that before, you know, that, you know, the tone or whatever is a certain thing, but I, it's one thing I'm sort of blind to. It's, you know, like, yeah, you just can't see it because it's, it's just who you are or something. I really like the scene where you talked about Ray Liotta pulling the, the, the thread off of your favorite shirt and you got really upset with him. <laughs> and then you guys became really good friends on the set uh, just throughout, you were, you were talking about that. And I'm envisioning as you're having drinks with Ray Liotta and you're talking with him and he's kind of giving you a hard time. I'm envisioning that scene in my head and I got a kick out of that. It was just, yeah. do you still have that t-shirt even though it's 30 years yeah. old? It was a Hawaii. It was a Hawaii shirt, but it was by the time by the time Ray was done with it, there really. I mean, I shouldn't have worn it in the first place. It was my lucky shirt. Right. And by the time he got done with it, I mean, there was there wasn't a shirt left. It was just, yeah. And you know, I mean, obviously Ray Liotta has that cackle that you hear sometimes when he's acting, but he definitely he laughs like that in person. He's a he's a crazy sort of guy. Yeah, great memory. You know, again, I lost my favorite shirt, but. I got a pretty good story out of that. Yeah, I don't. I, you have situations. You know, like man, these some of these situations are decades old. How did he? How did you remember all the details? I mean, to try to like curate and collect all that knowledge from so long past, you had to probably dig back into some old files mentally. Yeah, what's interesting is this will be funny for a guy who just wrote a memoir. Is I always think of myself as having a terrible memory. My friends tell me crazy things that I did when I was younger that. I, you know, I believe them because I like them, but I don't think that's how the story went down, you know, and, and, you know, that I did some ridiculous, crazy stuff. So the idea that somebody with a bad memory would be writing a memoir seems kind of ridiculous. But the other thing that was kind of interesting, I mean, it, and it was actually an obstacle to me, I thought, I can't, I don't remember what happened, 
when I started writing, suddenly, I, maybe it's because I'm an actor and you're, you're trained a little to be very aware of your surroundings. I, I, I think I was a sensitive child anyway with a vivid imagination, so I, I took those things in without knowing it. So once I started writing it, I'd be like, oh, yeah. Oh, and that smell, that smell that like, oh my gosh, that when I was at my grandmother's country house, that's like moist, but it's it's cool. You can feel the dew rising from the ground, you know, and the lightning bugs are crawling up the stalks of grass before they, you know, and all that stuff would just come to me because I put myself in the moment, you know, and this is the middle of the night again. I'm sitting by, you know, candlelight or a little lamp by my computer and there was no distractions. And so all that stuff would come up to me like, like a sense memory, you know, in, in, in acting. And so I would fill out those stories without really knowing it. It would come out onto the computer. And when I look at it a couple of days later, I'd be like, I didn't even remember that I remember that, you know, like it, it was, it was really kind of remarkable. And, and for that reason was, uh, I mean, like, I thought I'd process my dad's death. It'd been 25 years ago. I had the movie to deal with. I, sort of pictured him, his soul flying off into space, you know, like probably five or six years after he died. And so I thought I was pretty complete with all that. But when I started writing about it, I would frequently be just bawling my eyes out, typing about this drive that I took with my dad mm -hmm. or about going skinny dipping with him when he was in his 60s. And things that I not, just like I said, not remembered that I remembered. And they would be pouring out of me and pouring out of my eyes onto the thing as I'm trying desperately to get it down while it's in my mind, you know. And it was, uh, it was a humbling and wonderful experience how much more I processed my dad's passing and our relationship even when I thought I had already done it all, you know, been there, covered that, again, a whole other level. And appreciation of him really came out when I – really researched his childhood history that made him so much of the man he was to me as a dad. You know, it, it was it was humbling and very rewarding. So probably writing this book for you is very therapeutic for a lot of, just to process a lot of personal experience. And, and in that way, um, it's, it's both personally rewarding, but it's also personally enriching. You know, it's like you, you become kind of augmented in that kind of process of, of delivering all this memory onto paper and remembering all this stuff, going through it again. And, and uh, there's a lot to be said for that kind of review, that personal review of, of, of your, your history. Um, and I know that something like this, uh, producing a product like this can be very, um, um, say, therapeutic, you know, in that way. And, it, and for other reasons, like... For instance, I started writing the book because it was kind of a slow time in my career. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be sitting around waiting for the phone to ring. And the business was changing, and they were looking for people who had a lot more TV credits, and I had more movie credits. And I was feeling kind of hurt and left out by the business, so I thought I'd write this book. But it helped me put my whole career in context. When I wrote the book, I realized that I didn't necessarily set out to be an actor I set out to learn how to express my emotions that my father had always squashed down in me. Don't cry or I'll give you something to cry about. Right. And, you know, all those kind of things that my dad said to me that kept me from experience. I have all these emotions, but I can't express them. So they came out by punching the dirt and mm -hmm. punching stop signs when I was a kid and blooding my knuckles up. It, it gave an expression to the pain I was feeling. And I had come to grips with that in therapy and, and becoming an actor, you, you have to have your emotions available to you. So that was a hard, hard journey for me. But I realized that that's what my journey to being an actor was about, really. It was about learning how to express myself because my dad couldn't do that. So in a way, I was completing his life because as much as I made my peace with him, he didn't become a decidedly different person. He didn't become a huggy... I love you, son, kind of thing. In the book, I, I made a progression of how he went from, I'd say I love you, and he would ignore it, to thank you, to, oh, I appreciate you telling me. You know, that was as close as he could get to saying I love you back. But I ended up carrying his journey to being able to express himself 
you know, through me, because the gift, the gift he gave me was not being able to get that stuff out of me. And I pursued that journey, a heroic journey to go to Hollywood, to take classes so that I could learn how to express myself in a safe way. And, and now I, I love the person I am that I made that. I love to cry easily. I love to laugh easily. I love all those things about me that would never have happened if I hadn't wanted to, you know, be in show business. Right. When my career, you know, I would love it to have been something bigger. I would love to be Kevin Costner in, in some ways, you know, like done what he's done with his career. But when I look back on it, his call was a different call than mine. Mm -hmm. I had all those opportunities. I auditioned for Risky Business and Thelma and Louise against Brad Pitt and, you know, be down to the last few guys on it. I didn't get the part. You know, that was, that's heartbreaking after a while. But writing the book, I got to say, oh, okay, this wasn't about being a big star. I, right now, I wouldn't be a big star if you paid me. It's kind of a horrible trade-off that you make to give up your private life to, to be a public figure. At a time, I, of course I would have done that. That was the aim, you know. But now when I look back, I thought I became the guy I wanted to be by pursuing something that I never quite reached, you know. And, you know, in that way, it's a little like Moonlight Graham. You can go back and back, but if you have to give up being a doctor or what you became, you know, it's not worth it. That was a great dream, but that was, that was once upon a time, you know. So, you know, you could call it rationalization or sour grapes or whatever you want, but I'm happy with who I am, and the book helped me see how far I've come and what a great gift I got a, from my father's stoicism, my determination to get rid of that, and and all the fun I've had making that happen. You know, all the great actresses and actors I've met and gone and traveled the world doing shows in Australia and Ireland and, you know, and all across the country, theaters and other theater groups and all that stuff. That was just the means to it, which is... Here I am, and you know, it was a it was a good journey, and, and, and now I can look back and and you know make it in my own mind a heroic journey because you know in a way it was. Well, I I, I view you in, in the same light as any other superstar in Hollywood. You know, everybody has their own path, um, and everybody kind of you know it kind of circles back to our earlier thought that we're our kind of we critique ourselves in such a way that 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 we don't think we're maybe as good or but we're we're just as good as everything else. We just went our own way and everybody's got their own path. Um, and everybody's path is the right one for them. And that's, that's, that's where they should be. Um, and so, um, there's like, there's no real wrong answer there. It's just whatever answer is works for you. That's the right answer. Um, I think for a lot of us, we are always comparing ourselves with other people and other careers and, um, trying to think like if you self doubt, you know, I, I do that. I, I know a lot of us do that as humans. We just doubt ourselves. Like, you know, I kind of wish that we were and fill in the blank, but we're good enough. You know, you're good well, enough. Another great gift from, from writing the book was for the first 25 years of since the movie was shot, I was kind of embarrassed when people would say, oh, the other dreams, you're so great in that. You know, I was like, come on, it was the last five minutes of the movie. I mean, this is literally my inner critic saying totally. Any, anybody could have walked in after James Earl and Kevin and all those people did this great, they opened everybody's heart. Anybody could have walked in and done a great job with that scene. It's not like it's some brilliant acting character work or something like that. You know, that was sort of literally my opinion about it for those 25 years. I was polite enough to say thank you so much when people would say good job, but I would not have gone on a book tour or gone, you know, advertising myself as some expert on it. But writing that book, collected my thoughts and again put it in a context of like yeah I would did this small part in this movie there's a million other movies I didn't get the part in I can't talk about those but this is one I know as much about as anybody else certainly my part of it and I can own that and be okay with that like this is something I wanted to do and I did it I wanted to be in a movie that was like wonderful life I succeeded how many people can even say that you know, I didn't succeed in a larger sense the way I wanted to, but this, I can own this. I can I can make my peace with it, have people tell me how wonderful I was in the movie, and go, thank you. Yeah, I, I, 
I was well suited to play that role, and I gave it the best shot I could. And you know, I did a pretty good job. You know, I, I, I'd love to see somebody done a better job with that part. I mean, just partially, if they could, I'd be, I'd love to see it. But something about me and that role coincided in a way that that was wonderful. And I wouldn't have seen that if I hadn't written the book and kind of taken ownership of it and kind of realized like. Yeah, I was born to play John Kinsella. Maybe okay. all that other crap I did was just getting me there. I had to get that little part so that I was eligible to go in for the audition for this. And, you know, I mean, it's it's pretty pretty amazing. You know, when you, when you write it, you can suddenly own it. And it's been a great boon to my self-confidence and my... My look, my nostalgic look back at, you know, a long career doing something I love to do, but maybe didn't quite have the success I once hoped for. I guess it all depends on how you define success, right? Like, I think you're successful. I, I look, I see you as in the same light as all the people you maybe compare yourself against. I, I don't know, but um, to me, your character is just as important as any other character in the movie. If not, in some ways, depending on how you look at it, um, maybe had more of an impact at the, because you were the, you were the, kind of the cherry on top in the movie. And so, um, you know, I see it as like you, you were, you made an impact on me growing up from the movie and I, I will always remember that scene. And, and so it's, I kind of just have to encourage you to, to realize like you are successful. You did very well. You've done very well. You're doing very well. Um, and if we define success as a lot of us put money on top of it. I know I have in the past, like if I'm not making this amount of money, I'm not the successful, but look at all the things we've done, you know, it's, it's accomplishments, you know, it's, it's delivering on a goal, you know, having a goal of writing a book, you did that. Um, uh, you're changing lives with people that you meet, you've done that. Um, you, so, so to me, you're very successful. And I think that it, it just comes back to how, how is success defined a on each one of us, but really it comes back to, again, our own self-criticism, right? That, you know, so, not accepting that we're as successful as we are. We're, you've done it. You did it. You, you've changed lives with a lot of people. You've touched people's lives you now haven't met because they've read your book, you know? And I, before you met me in, in August, you know, I, I, I'd always, it was always growing up, this was always such a big part of my life, like, um, uh, and, and so when I, when I saw you at the show, I was like, I got to go talk to him because that's a very special person in my life as you know from my background I have to go see him so um, that changed my life in a way for the better and so I, I think that you're very successful and well, it's funny, Patrick. I feel the same way about you you know when I first saw you I thought this guy's got something special I should talk to him and you know whatever and I I you know I agreed to do this interview I, I don't know if it'll make any difference to me but you know what I mean? That's, what's the, that's the problem, is that I can see that in you, and you can see that in me. And I mean, that's why there's more than one of us here in the world, is because we need other people's point of view. And that's, you know, partially what I enjoy so much about traveling around and meeting other, you know, people who didn't have the advantage of spending 30 years of their lives learning how to express their emotions. And they come up and hug me like a brick, and tears pour out in spite of themselves, and they're apologizing, and my dad, you know, whatever, and I know what they're going through, so I can just embrace it and say, oh my God, this is so good for you, you know, I mean, how many people, if these things come up to me, and so do Voce, like, so that nobody else can hear, uh, I, I cried at your movie, they tell me, like, they're the only people in the world who were emotionally touched, but that's how, that's how bottled up they are, you know, they have to tell me kind of like in a whisper, I, I don't tell anybody this, and, you know, and it, it's wonderful to know that that's a dirty little secret that they have, that they cry during Field of Dreams, you know, and that their kids make fun of them. Why is dad crying, you know? And if I can be the one place where they can go, yeah, I miss my dad, and I can say, I know, I miss mine too, and, you know, we can have a second. It, it's, yeah, it's just icing on this beautiful cake that's, you know, Field of Dreams in my life. It's been great. I mean, it's 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 been it's been great chatting with you. I've got a couple more questions here, Dwyer, but it's been an excellent experience for me to get to know you as as an actor, as a person, um, and just kind of like hear your journey and hear your experience. Um, and I, I'm confident that those who are watching have maybe at least at least my hope is that they'll kind of maybe look at 
look at things a little differently. Maybe the next time they watch a movie, maybe the next time they think about their fathers, or maybe the next time they look at and you know evaluate their own selves. Because a lot of what we've talked about is kind of like, in a way, it's sort of self-search, right? You know, you kind of like have to look for kind of how you fit, but you also have to kind of look where you ha what, how how are how are you how how did you become you based on your relationship with your father? You know, and how has that benefited kind of your your own life? And it, those are nice revelations to have I think in life um, I had a couple more questions here for you um, here's we're gonna kinda talk about acting for a bit uh, these last couple questions here what's the most difficult thing about being an actor and in your experience what's required to achieve success well I'll start this by saying things have changed in the acting business from when I started sure. when I started, in a lot of ways a lot more actors I think also, a lot more TV shows, but let's see. One of the hardest things. One of the hardest things is you're frequently waiting for somebody to call you for a job. Um, in the old days, I mean, there's a time when I had a lot of auditions, but nonetheless, uh, an actor has to wait till somebody gives them a place to exercise their craft. Uh, that's not entirely true, but in the movie business, kind of true. I ended up starting a lot of theater groups and performing under my own auspices if I couldn't get a job somewhere else. So that's the way I combated it. Obviously, today, you can make your own movies, literally, and put them on YouTube. And a lot of people have found great success with that, you know, right. making music videos. And So there's a lot more outlet for that, but it also requires a lot more self-discipline and 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 you have to be your own quality control because there is none on YouTube. You know what I mean? You, you're not going to stand out if you're just some other guy doing some other thing. You have to really start thinking outside the box and present yourself in a way that's going to further your endeavors, your creativity, whatever. Um, yeah, so part of it is, is kind of waiting for the phone to ring, mm -hmm. as they say. Uh, and the other part is, you know, you, is again, this critic. You're constantly dealing with yourself, critic. You go in for an audition, you don't get it. It's bad when you do a terrible audition, but it's also bad when you do a great audition and then don't get the part. You don't know, did they hire him because he, he knew this actor, worked with him before? You happen to look like his uncle who he always hated? Or, you know, it's like you're constantly put into circumstances where you have no control. And so if you don't have some strong sense of mission or of yourself. I mean, I always lacked confidence. I would say if there's anything that would have made a difference in my career, it was just having some self-confidence. So, and that's nothing I could do about then. Probably still can't do anything about it. You know, you, I've become more confident, but, you know, I wish I was one of those guys who brags about himself all the time and in a party with producers he can say oh yeah you know whatever i just never been that guy i always want to let my work speak for itself and it's not a good quality a lot of the values that my parents taught me being christian midwestern person they're not very helpful in show business it's almost the opposite you know the guy the squeaky wheel gets the grease and the early bird you know like you if if you go into a room and you're just the you know, think of yourself as the coolest guy there. That's who people are crowd to. And I was always the guy sitting in the corner, kind of like, I hope somebody notices me. I'm a really nice person, you know. So, uh, you know, and, and you know, you can't fake self confidence. You don't want to be that guy who's faking it. But some people have it. I mean, you know, it, it's just, it comes from your life the same way that the great things I got from my dad made me who I am, you know, along with everything I did to. You know, but some people have that self-confidence, a certain narcissism. Narcissism's great for actors, too. It's not like I want to be a narcissist, but I can't tell you that it doesn't help you if you think you're the best thing that on two feet, you know. But, you know, it, like I said, it's a trade-off. It kind of leads me to my other question, you know, and it's you kind of answered it already a lot, but... Um... What advice can you give to the aspiring actor who's just starting out? Like, so they just moved to LA and they want to be the next superstar. What, what kind of, like, I guess if you, two or three lines on an elevator, right? You want to just give them two or three 
quick pitches, what, well, what kind of advice would you give them? I mean, I'd say if you love acting, performing, whatever, you just have to do it. You can't start out waiting for somebody to find you because that's not how it happens. I mean, it, it does happen. You know, if somebody gets, becomes famous from a reality show or some other thing, mm -hmm. you have to, you have to be your own best advocate and you can get an agent and then think, okay, I'm done. My agent's taking care of me. That doesn't work either. Once your agent takes you on, then you have to be on your agent and you have to, you know, I mean, I had to teach myself to go into my agent's office, put on that, I felt like crap about myself, but I had to go in there and be like, hey, what's going on? Oh man, I'm working on this play. And it's a most amazing play. I'm not working on a play. I'm doing a scene in class or something, but you got to kind of build the mystique, you know, if, if, if you want to have that kind of energy, you've got to bring it, you know, people can take that and, and put it up onto a higher platform, a bigger profile, but you have to kind of bring it. And you have so many tools. I know nobody really wants to sit around and make a movie, but if you make a movie, you learn a lot. In the same way, I learned a lot by writing a book. You learn how these different camera angles look this way. So then suddenly when you do get that next little gig and you just got one little line, you know how the, where the camera's going to look good on you or you know all this stuff or you say something to somebody who says like, oh, you know what? It feels like if my character did this, you know, had this little extra moment where I say this word, then I'll, you know, and then if they think it's a good idea, then suddenly you got a line in your first deal. And then, you know, it's, you, you have to practice confidence and you have to practice your craft. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? There's so many people who just say, I'm an actor, you know, come to Hollywood and wait for somebody to find you. And it, it just, it, I, I, I don't see it working that way. Yeah. I mean, not on a level if, if you're serious about it. And if you don't have that drive to get the door slammed in your face, to do a brilliant per performance in a play that nobody comes to see, or do a, you know, or a movie that doesn't get finished because the star of it has a sexual harassment lawsuit before they release it or some other crazy, all that kind of crazy stuff that actually happens to people, then you are probably not cut out to be in the business it, 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 to succeed in the way that you probably want to succeed. Yeah. Like yes. I, Go ahead. I got so much, I got so much out of my pursuit. It wasn't what I was after, but it was to me so much more valuable. And if you have that attitude, then the setbacks are meaningless because they're not stopping you from getting to where you're going. They're just something that you're, they're just a hurdle you're crossing to get to. And, and you, I didn't know that that's what I was doing with my career. Now I can look back and say that's what I was doing. So it doesn't matter if you're blind. I still love that line. Some things it's better not to know. Don't know that it takes a year for you to write your book. Write it anyway. Don't know that it takes a, an agent and publicist and all kinds of stuff for you to become a star, go act anyway. Mm -hmm. If that stuff reveals itself to you, take it in. Don't ignore it. But you can only be naive and innocent once in your life, yeah. you know? And that to me is part of the problem today is we see everything on YouTube, so we don't dream about what we could do. You, you see some great video and you're like, oh, shoot, uh, that was an idea I had. Now it's already out there. What am I going to do? I mean... I think sometimes you're better not knowing all the great things that are out there because it gives you room to dream them and then create them for yourself. Yeah, those are that's a that last part really mission critical. I think is that if you don't expose yourself to eight hours of YouTube videos throughout the day, it'll give you more uh, creative integrity when you're working on your own product because you're not influenced by everybody else's product. Right, and if you finish it and it turns out, oh my God, it looks just like that one. I wish I'd seen that before. You've still learned so much. Yeah. It. It, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, really, and, you got to the long run. And, too, if that does happen, you at least can think to yourself, well, I wasn't influenced to create what I created because of that. So you yeah. always, you can sleep better at night knowing that you created it authentically. Right. Um, they, and they that, that's, that's their, beneficial. You know, yeah. Um, the other thing is, too, you had mentioned that, that you know, it, if, if you're not confident out in Hollywood to get your, your door slammed on your face, like it might not be the right career path, but that is going to happen in life anyway, somewhere along the line. Like if it's not in acting, it'll be in applying for a job or, you know, um, 
going through a performance evaluation or you know going through a breakup, life just throws this stuff at us. Right. And from so different that's angles. The downside to having so much of our life publicized in, in, in social media. Yeah. All the fail videos. I mean, you can't help watch them and kind of go to yourself, ah, oh, I never want to fail like that. But if you don't know that that's out there, you got to fail. I mean, yeah. everybody can tell you that from Greek times that right. you cannot be great without risking failure. I mean, and, failure is like just the prerequisite to success, right? You have to fail a bunch of times to finally right. get it right. You but know. frequently in the old days, I could fail. I did some stupid things. I went to an audition, did such a bad audition. I went home, changed my clothes, tried to change my hair, and went back and pretended to be somebody else at an audition. Now, when I think back on that, it's cringeworthy, embarrassing. I mean, no people knew who I was. I'm sure they're looking at me like, weren't you just here? What? What's wrong with you, dude? Like, I mean, they probably were, you know, calling security or something, but... I, if I'd seen that on video, and you know, if that had to live with me for the rest of my life, you know, like if I had, a, there's a video of that that's on greatest fails, yeah. it's 100 million views, I mean, you know, I would think twice about doing it the next time. And I think you can't do that if you're really serious about being an actor. You've got to fall flat on your face, and you've got to have the self-worth to pick yourself up from that. I mean, and some people don't. I mean, you know, people kill themselves. You know, artists kill themselves because they can't extricate the reaction of the world from what's real about them, yeah. you know, which is sad, so sad. Uh, that stuff helps us become stronger if we let it. And, and, and us as stronger people helps us become more successful people. But we have to let those things happen to us and be okay with it. We have to let ourselves get back up and try it again. As a skateboarder myself, I always, you know, I, I always kind of like, Use that as the, the, the like metaphor of you know, run, run a business, you're going to fall a few bunch of times. You're going to fail a bunch of times. Skateboarding, same thing. And you finally land a trick and finally find a successful whatever you're doing. Um, it, you really embrace it and you appreciate it so much more because you, you know how long it takes to uh, get to that place where you can be successful in doing whatever it is you're doing. You know? uh, this thing that you know, first businesses have a success rate of maybe 20%, but mm -hmm. second businesses have like a 38% or something. You know, like... And you don't get to your second business till your first one fails. Right. You know, and like, and and you know that's just that's just part of of any creative career. You, you know? learn all that stuff in that first one that you can apply to the second one, knowing all the process. Kind of like you wrote this book, and so you know how the process of writing a book and publishing it goes. Now you, your second book will be less time intensive because you know the process. Right. You've already built out the tools, the platforms, the process. Now you just can apply everything to the second pro the second book. So in that capacity, um, you know, uh, the first time of anything is always the hardest, and then it becomes easier and better and just more robust every time you, you whatever it is you're, you're applying. And I really can appreciate that a lot. You have to kind of let yourself do that one time. It's scary. Writing a book is scary. Starting a business is scary. You know, going and trying out for a new movie, I'm sure it's scary because you don't know the people or the, you don't know what kind of situations you're getting into. I mean, I'll take your word for it because I'm not an actor, but um, I think that you can, uh, you can understand the benefit of coming out on the other side and looking at it from a different way and knowing, learning all the things that you learned in that, that process and applying that to whatever it is you're going to do next. There's a lot to be said for that. And that's, that's good wisdom, you know. Um, good stuff. Um, Kind of moving into my other, my, another question here. You've worked in the industry for a long time. Um, have you kept in touch with any of the actors you've worked with over the years? Um, I mean, sort of surprisingly not. I mean, I see guys at auditions like the, uh, the, the, let's see, who did I say that? The players, some of the ghost players amongst the seven other White Sox who are, those are guys I see saw auditions fairly regularly. It doesn't happen the way it used to, but those guys I see all the time. I liked them before the movie. I still like them. Uh, you know, Art Lafleur, yeah, texted me the other day. And, but, you know, I mean, Kevin just lives 15 minutes up the coast from me. So, I mean, and I, I run into him, but mostly it functions of, of you know, Field of Dreams or, or I guess see his band play or something, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting... Uh, you know, actors make jokes about it amongst themselves. You get so close when you're working together. Everybody loves each other. Actors are just that way, you know. And then, oh, yeah, we're going to stay in touch. We're going to stay in touch. Nothing. You know, like, 
I mean, it, it just happens. It's a it's an occupational hazard in this business because we all live separately, and you know, frequently you're off on some other project, and you're meeting somebody else who you really like and that you would be lifetime friends with if they happen to be your neighbor or something, you know. But when you see them once every million years, you know, you it just gets harder. Do you ever wish that you could? I mean, do you ever? Would you like to have those kind of relationships with, with the actors, like just to be, be friends, like go hang out with them? Or would that be beneficial to you in some way? And anybody, I mean, as, as an actor in general, do you think that those, those are beneficial relationships to form outside of the, the, the screen? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, I get as starstruck sometimes as other people. You know, there's just certain people that I'm like, oh, my God, I, I, I want to be their best friend. You know, like, and I mean, I suppose in a lot of ways it would be beneficial. I mean, I lived in Hollywood for 13 years, and then I moved to a small town about an hour away, and I loved being away from that because, I mean, and I love actors. Most of my friends are actors, but when you're an actor, all your friends are actors, you're in the acting business, you're all waiting for the phone to ring, it becomes too much, you know? I wanted, I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere, so I bought a two-acre farm with a little creek running through it, my first house out of Hollywood. And I couldn't have been happier. All my neighbors thought I was a big star because I wasn't in a room with people who were really big stars <laughs> next to me, you know. I was the biggest star they'd ever met, so, you know, I had that advantage, which was great for me to build my confidence and my, you know, my uh, sense of, of accomplishment in myself. And at the same time, I could raise my kids and go to the grocery store and not change clothes or fix my hair or shave and, and, and you know, nobody cared, you know, so... To me, it was a good move for me, but I think that, again, came from having grown up in, in a kind of rural environment, so it was comfortable for me. Yeah, I mean, that, those are great points, not having to feel like you're having to prepare at every small minutia thing that we do as, you know, in our lives, like go to the grocery store and the bank and the post office. And... But at the same time, it did hurt to not be, I wouldn't go to Hollywood parties, I wouldn't drive an hour and a half to go to a Hollywood party, but I realized... I never liked those Hollywood parties that much anyway. I met, you know, I mean, I met a lot of big stars at parties, you know, and you shake hands with them or have a great night or, you know, sing songs and get drunk and think you're best friends. And, you know, but again, I was usually the guy sitting in the corner going like, you know, and yeah, it's, it, yeah, it just never was a scene for me. So it wasn't that much to, to give that up. And, and I would never, I would never regret the decision to kind of get out of Hollywood and, and just go in for auditions and come out and, and not, you know, wallow in it day and night the way I did for, you know, the first 13 years. There was a time for everything in those situations, I, right? I loved it when I was there. I yeah. was farm, and I suddenly, I got palm trees. I came to LA and I'm like, <laughs> you know, the palm trees, it's like, where am I? Is this a Jurassic Park? Or like, I mean, I didn't really have a sense that palm trees really existed and people had them in their yards and you know like I mean those those are stupid examples but that's how green I was you know like that's like like I said some things it's better not to know right and so it made coming to Hollywood like an amusement park in the first place because everything was different you know I, mean, I remember my first Christmas out here there's like tinsel and fake snow sprayed on the in 90 degree heat coming down you're like hold on this is Christmas and like there's I mean, it was just, it's just weird that there's a whole other world out there of people living in a completely different environment. I don't know how I survived the rejection that you go through in the acting business. People would always say it to me, and I'd be like, I don't know, I don't feel rejected, really. I mean, but you are. You're rejected constantly. And now I think I've reached my limit of rejection. I, I feel like, you know, my body of work that I've done, you should be able to look at that and say, okay, this guy can walk across the room, say these three lines, and be convincing. <laughs> you know, I shouldn't have to, you know, like, go in and audition against 50 other people for stuff. So, I don't know, I'm a little bit over the rejection of Hollywood. And so, you know, and again, how many movies like Field of Dreams have there been? To me, that's a genre that suits me, and yeah. it's not it's not a popular genre. So it's harder to find stuff. I mean, as I mentioned in the book, I, I got killed, you know, for a period of time. I was killed in every project I was in for a couple of years, you know, which is weird. And then I went through a period where 
I had children. I was a father whose kids had been abducted for, you know, probably two years. I did, you know, eight episodes of having my kid <laughs> abducted and killed or whatever, you know. And I don't know. It, it just after a while, I was like, oh, gosh, there's better things in the world to, to spend our time with. And, you know, so I'm choosier than I used to be. So. I guess I'll leave it at that. Yeah, excellent. Dwyer, uh, it's been really great talking with you. Thanks so much for sitting down to me. I know we kind of extended the time frame quite a bit more, but we had a great conversation. I really appreciated the time you were able to give to me today. Uh, this is Dwyer Brown. He played the character John Kinsella in the movie Field of Dreams. He wrote this book, If You Build It. It's about the movie. It's about his experience growing up, and it's about um, fathers. And it's just a really awesome, awesome book. Great book. Really excellent read. Click down the link below to get your copy. I really recommend it. Uh, Dwyer, thank you so much for sitting down with me. I really feel like this was a very special um, interaction for me. I'm, I'm very grateful to have been able to have this opportunity. Well, thank you. I, I felt really drawn to do it uh, just because of who you are, Patrick. So I, I, I know that you're far enough along that you'll hang on to that. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to have been able to do it. Excellent. Excellent. I, I'm so, so thankful. Thank you for tuning in to Radicards TV on Radicards.com. I'm your host, Patrick Greeno. Thank you again, Dwyer Brown. And until next time, enjoy collecting. If you like this content, please subscribe. Thank you. Enjoy collecting.